Hello. Unfortunately, I cannot be there with you guys in person tonight. So you guys get to listen to me on video. Um, I truly wish I could be there, but there are some things outside of my control. If you would please keep my family in your thoughts and prayers right now. Um, my dad's having some issues. So tonight we're going to talk about law enforcement. Now, this always has a special place in my heart because I spent a quarter of a century doing this. So it means a lot to me. Um, let's begin by talking about the development of policing. Now, there's no single agency that has oversight responsibility of all of the different police agencies in the country. <clears throat> Excuse me. It just doesn't exist. Um, there's no Department of Policing or, or Law Enforcement we do have the Department of Justice, but their job isn't to maintain oversight over law enforcement agencies. There's also no central authority person or agency <clears throat> that coordinates law enforcement activities, professionalism, or administrative oversight over those law enforcement agencies nationwide. Most of the time it's left at the state level. In fact, it's always left at the state level. Here in Georgia, we... Um, our oversight is conducted by the Georgia Peace Officer Standards and Training Council, or POST. Most states have an organization similar or like named. Um, these organizations set up the training standards. The um, If you have to have an officer disciplined, they're the ones who are responsible for it, things like that. Um, so... One of the things that it's important to remember is the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878. Um, and that act limited the power of local governments and law enforcement in using federal military personnel to enforce the laws of the land. Now, this is why you don't see, except in extreme circumstances where a state of emergency has been declared, military personnel in tanks rolling down your street enforcing the laws. It just doesn't happen because of the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878. Now, who decides what an agency does? Well, the responsibilities, accountability, and the powers all are determined by the jurisdiction. Let's say it's the city of Tacoa Police Department. Their controlled or their oversight is through the city of Tacoa, mostly their city council. Um, the Stevens County Sheriff's Office is the Stephen County, correction, Stevens County Board of Commissioners, um, and the sheriff himself. So what does jurisdiction really mean? Jurisdiction is the geographic limits in which officers of an agency are empowered to perform their duties. Now, if they're a county police department, guess what? Their jurisdiction is the county. If there's a city or a municipal police department, it's that city, the municipality. Um, if it's the state, you know, like God's special police, <laughs> GSP, then it's the entire state of Georgia. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you remember back a few weeks ago, we talked about the different levels of law enforcement. You had federal, state, and local. Well, we're going to talk more in depth about those tonight. So when it comes to federal law enforcement, um, there are a ton of different federal jurisdictions, correction, federal agencies, each with a different jurisdiction and administrative leadership. And they've all been developed to handle the enforcement of federal laws. You have the Department of Homeland Security, which is tasked with keeping and maintaining security across the United States. You have the CIA, which is actually foreign soil. You have the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, which is to investigate crimes, especially things like uh, kidnappings. You have the Secret Service, uh, Department of Treasury, the, all of these different agencies and organizations have different jurisdictions, have different operating uh, orders, if you will. So now, these agencies are under the administrative control of the executive branch of the federal government, <clears throat> i.e. the president, and they only enforce federal laws. You're not going to have the FBI come in and enforce 
city ordinance in Helen, Georgia. It's just not going to happen. Why? Because that's not their purview. That's not their jurisdiction. That's not what they do. So there are three distinctively different types of federal agencies. First is the military police. Second is Native American tribal police. And third is civilian police. Now break those down. Military police is exactly what it sounds like. They're assigned to the military, to a branch of the military. You have the Naval Criminal Investigative Services. Um, you have the MPs for the army and for different bases. So that's all they do. They handle military personnel and military facilities. Then you have the Native American Tribal Police. They are made up of the different tribes of Native Americans across the United States, and they handle tribal matters. They also handle tribal lands. And then the Civilian Police. And that's where we get expansive. Um, you have the U.S. Marshal Service, Postal Inspection Service, Yes, the Postal Service has their own law enforcement, the Postal Inspection Service. The U.S. Secret Service, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Bureau of Tobacco Correction, Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and then the Drug Enforcement Agency, or DEA. So, like I said, military police perform law enforcement duties on military bases on certain federal lands and in certain cases involving military personnel. An example of that was I had a Marine who had committed a felony, a couple of felonies actually, um, when I was working in Metro Atlanta. That um, Marine, after he was arrested, it was reported to the military and they came and picked him up. And because he was charged with felonies, and these were pretty, um, pretty bad, um, he was charged with aggravated sexual battery and false imprisonment. He had um, all but attempted to rape a woman. So he was charged with that. And then the military came and got him because he was subject not only to the laws in the state of Georgia, but he was also subject to the Uniform Military Code of Justice, UCMJ. And he had violated that by doing what he had done. So the military came out and picked him up. Um, and each of the four branches of the military have their own unique strategy for providing police services, conducting criminal investigations, and maintaining order. So, and like I said, their job is to enforce the UCMJ, or the Uniform Military Code of Justice. And you have the Native American Tribal Police, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the BIA, and the military both have limited jurisdiction on reservations, including federal police. So each Native American reservation has the legal authority to establish its own tribal police force to provide police services. Um, they provide services pretty similar to those of your local civilian law enforcement agencies. Um, now, if there's a felony that occurs on uh, tribal lands, then the FBI has a responsibility for investigating those felonies. Um, in 1995, the Attorney General established the Office of Tribal Justice to coordinate tribal issues for the Department of Justice. So now we're going to talk about all of those federal civilian police. Um, so what are the duties of them? You have the Marshal Service, and they're charged with overseeing federal court security, serving papers of the federal courts, and performing some federal law enforcement duties. Um, they're in charge of movement and custody of federal prisoners, and they capture federal inmates who escape from federal penitentiaries or who are wanted by the federal government. Um, they also are deemed with managing and selling federal assets and protecting witnesses. I mean, we've all heard of Witsetkin um, going into witness protection. These are the guys who do that. So... Now you have the U.S. Secret Service. Now that's the federal agency that protects the president, the vice president, members of their families, major candidates for office, and visiting heads of foreign governments. Then you have the FBI. They protect the United States from terrorist attacks, um, protect the U.S. against foreign intelligence operations and espionage in the United States. And I make that distinction because overseas, that job falls to the CIA. 
or the Central Intelligence Agency. And also, the FBI is to protect the United States against cyber-based attacks and high-tech crimes. And they do that in concert with the NSA, or National Security Agency. Um, the FBI also combats public corruption, protects civil rights, and cons combats transnational and national criminal organizations and enterprises. Um, when Al Capone went down, it was for tax evasion, but it was through the FBI. Um, they're also tasked with combating uh, significant violent crime and major white collar crime. They also work to provide partnerships and support for federal, state, local, and international partners. And they work to update technology so that they can successfully support and perform their mission. Next, we have the DEA, or the Drug Enforcement Agency, or Correction Administration, and they enforce US laws and regulations regarding controlled substances and support non-enforcement programs intended to reduce the availability of illicit controlled substances domestically. So basically their job is to anything that deals with drugs, it's their job to enforce and make sure that things are being done correctly. Then you have the ATF, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Now they enforce laws and regulations regarding controlled substances and um, sorry, <laughs> they actually control um, licensure for firearms, who can sell firearms. Um, when you try to buy certain firearms, you have to have some licensure. These are the guys who make sure that you're good to go. Um, they also deal with anything that's controlled, like explosives course, explosives, you have to be permitted and all of that. Um, these are the guys who investigate all of that. So now we've covered all the federal. Now we're going to move down to state. So the state law enforcement agencies can be divided into three major types. You're going to want to know this. Um, traffic enforcement, general criminal investigations, and special investigations. Now the ones that focus on traffic enforcement are typically called highway patrol in the state of Georgia. Like I've said, it's the Georgia State Patrol. So you also have their investigative unit, which in the case of the state of Georgia is the GBI. Now, what's but what about the special investigations? Well, that would be like the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, DNR, game wardens, the ones who make sure that you're not hunting out of season, that you're not spotlighting deer, that you're not baiting them, things like that. So now we're going to move down to the local level. One of those is the county law enforcement. Um, now, a sheriff has countywide jurisdiction, and they're called the chief law enforcement officer in that county. Mostly, they're elected officials. Here in Georgia, they are. Um, now, deputy sheriffs are law enforcement officers who assist or work for the sheriff. And officers of the court are law enforcement officers who serve the court by serving papers, providing courtroom security, and transporting incarcerated defendants. Um, they differ from your local law enforcement agencies, your police departments, in that they have, the sheriffs have countywide jurisdiction, whereas police departments typically only have it within that municipality. Now, are there countywide police departments? Yes. What is their jurisdiction? The county. But they're not tasked with some of the things that the sheriff's office is. The sheriff's office specifically is constitutionally obligated to deal with the courts. So the three main responsibilities of the sheriff are to perform law enforcement duties, to operate the county jail, and serve as officers of the court. They are required by the Constitution to do those things. So... Now the last level we have are the local law enforcement, the cops. Now each incorporated town or city in the United States has the power to establish its own police department and its own laws. Now municipal or local police far outnumber all, over, all other types of law enforcement officers out there. 
And as cities have merged into large metropolitan areas, police departments have responded by expanding the geographical jurisdiction of municipal police officers through interagency agreements or inner city and interagency agreements. What does that mean? Well, in Habersham, let's say you have a major incident going on in the city of Demarest. Well, they have an agreement between the cities of Cornelia and Clarksville so that if there's a major incident in Demarest, Clarksville and Cornelia will also respond and come help. Um, that way you're sort of sharing the burden rather than pressing everyone so thin. So order maintenance is when law enforcement officers use informal conflict resolution skills to diffuse conflicts between citizens and restore order. And that's part of what law enforcement is supposed to do is to maintain order. Um, but the main responsibilities, the three recognized responsibilities are to enforce traffic laws, investigate accidents and patrol. They also are the first responders to incidents. They investigate property crime and violent crime. They respond to re requests for service. Um, again, back to that order maintenance. And then they investigate murders and other violent crimes. So what is the structure of the municipal police? You have what's called command and control structure. It's a hierarchical administrative structure organized by ranks with a single person responsible for all personnel in the organization, usually called the chief. Um, if you look in your text, there's a pyramid type diagram that has chief of police, then the deputy chief, major, captain, lieutenant, sergeant, corporal, and police officer. And as it goes down, it of course gets bigger. Um, now, does every agency have every single one of these positions? No. My agency was small, so we had very little of that. But it's important to understand there is this hierarchical structure. As it goes up, there's fewer and fewer. So how do you become chief? Hmm. Well, first, you got to get hired as a police officer. So what's the hiring process? Step one, meet the qualifications. In the state of Georgia, the minimum qualifications are you cannot have been convicted of a felony and you're a high school graduate who is at least 18 years of age. Step two, typically there's a written exam. Step three, physical fitness, because we don't want you stroking out on the job. Step four is the oral exam. We want to make sure you can actually talk to people because it's kind of important. Um, step five is a polygraph test. We want to make sure you're not going to lie. Um, step six is your character investigation. That's one of the biggest ones. Step seven is the medical screen screening. Step eight is the drug screening. Step nine is the psychological evaluation. Step 10, the recruit academy. Step 11, field training. Step 12, probationary status. Step 13, civil service status. So we're going to dive into these just for a few minutes so that I, you guys get a better understanding of each of them. Um, the written exam is pretty basic. Uh, we understand in law enforcement that most people only read at about a fifth grade level now. So we don't, you know, you don't have to read at the, you know, doctoral level. But we do want to make sure you can do basic sentences. It's kind of important. Um, and like I said, the physical fitness test. Now, most agencies don't do like you have to lift this much and you have to run this far in this amount of time. It's about being able to lift people, being able to run toward a situation, being able to control yourself. Um, so you want to know that people can do basic things. Um, and like I said, you know, the oral exam, you want to make sure that people can talk to other people. Um, the polygraph test. Most agencies have moved away from just a straight polygraph. They use things like a computer voice stress analyzer, a CVSA, which is another lie detector test that measures changes in vocal patterns as related to telling the truth or telling lies. Um, 
like I said, step six, the character investigation. That's the big one. Um, that's usually a huge packet that the individual fills out. Um, I think the longest one I've ever seen was 52 pages. Um, but it, I mean, everything, every single thing about you, you have to tell. And then it's investigated to make sure that it was truthful, to find out any kind of clarifying information that, you know, could help um, either qualify you or disqualify you as a potential candidate. Um, the medical screening, it's just a basic medical screening to make sure, you know, you're not going to kill over with, you know, within the first like three months of the job. Um, the drug screening, again, we don't want you using illegal drugs that you are tasked with enforcing the laws on while you're on duty. Um, the psychological evaluation is exactly what it sounds like. It's to make sure that your psyche is capable of handling the stress of working in law enforcement, which law enforcement has an inordinate amount of stress. Um, the Recruit Academy, that's your basic training. That's how you learn how to learn be, to be a cop. Um, no, I didn't say that. that I, it sounded kind of weird the way I said that, but it's the truth. You don't learn how to be a cop. You learn how to learn how to be a cop. You learn the basics of, you know, what are the laws? What are some of the procedures that are pretty standard? What are some things that you need to know regardless of where you go to work? Um, where you learn to actually be a cop is in that step 11, that field training. Um, once you complete the successfully complete the field training, then you go into that probationary status. And once that is over, then you go into what's known as civil service status. That's you're a full cop, no longer on probation, you're fully trained, you should know what you're doing. So what are some of the unique aspects of law enforcement? Remember I talked about that psychological evaluation? Well, some of the things that you have to deal with, one of the reasons that the, you have that psychological evaluation is that you have shift work. It's by its very nature, it's dangerous. And there's a lot of stress. So what about the shift work? You know, you rotate on different shifts and that causes physical and psychological distress. Failure to deal with that stress can result in harmful behaviors, self-destructive behaviors, alcoholism, cigarette smoking, drug abuse, um, extramarital activities. Um, and you always have this constant fear or correction, constant threat of danger throughout the job. So you need to understand that, that all of that exists and we want to make sure that you can handle that successfully. Um, now we're going to move on to another topic, the special police and private protection. Now, special police have limited jurisdictions and include things like airport police, park police, transit police, um, public school police, college and university police, public housing police, game wardens, alcoholic beverage control agency police, and special investigative units. Um, and then you have also private security, and these are services used by airports, banks, corporations, hospitals, nuclear facilities, railroad companies, schools, and retail companies. Um, now there's two types of public security. One is proprietary services. The other is uh, contract services. Now proprietary services are security forces that are owned and managed by a company. Um, Pinkerton Security. Uh, Duke Energy has their own security force for, to protect their nuclear power plants. Um, Piedmont College Campus Police Department. Piedmont College hires these people to work as police to officers. Um, and then you have contract services, and that's security personnel who work for a third-party company that are hired by another company to provide specific services at the discretion and direction of the client. Um, this is, you know, ABC security who may work at the mall and they work at the hospital. So they work in different areas, but they all work for this one big company and that company assigns you to different places to work. 
So let's talk about operational strategies in law enforcement. Um, now, the police scholar James Q. Wilson proposed that rather than viewing police behavior as random and independent of community values, the style of policing and hence the behavior of the police officer should be viewed as closely related to the type of city government and community expectations. Well, that's a really fancy way of saying that the public dictates how the law enforcement officers will behave. So according to Wilson, there are three styles of policing. You have the legalistic, which focuses on law enforcement and professionalism, and these are associated with reform-minded cities. Um, they're, you know, they wear body cams, and if they charge this person, they're always going to charge that person that charge, no matter who it is or who they are or, or any kind of mitigating circumstances. They're also very professional. Um, then you have the watchmen. That's the second type, watchmen. And they focus on maintaining order and they're associated with declining industrial blue collar communities. Um, areas that are having, you know, difficult times in, you know, financially, Detroit is a good example of that. Um, and they just want to, you know, maintain order, you know, whether they enforce the law or not, they want to make sure and just keep order, keep everybody safe. Then you have service, the service minded, you know, we already have the legalistic, we have the watchman, now we have the service oriented and they focus on protecting a homogenous suburban middle-class community against outsiders and providing service to those community residents. Um, I can think of a few examples, but I'm trying to be nice. Um, but this is when you have a mostly upper middle class white neighborhood and all of your officers are white. They look exactly like the people they're protecting. And anybody that's not from that area or doesn't look like they're from that area is investigated. So let's talk now about community policing. Now, some common characteristics of that are it's a focus on decentralized decentralized strategies that promote crime prevention rather than rapid response, crime investigation, and apprehension of the criminal. It's about stopping the crime before it happens rather than responding to crime after it occurs. And its focus is on promoting the quality of life of the community and public order rather than law enforcement. Um, this is such a safe place to live. That's what it's about. Um, and it uses alternatives other than arrest and force to solve the problem. And they respond to the symptoms. They, I'm sorry, they don't respond just to the symptoms of the problem. They work to solve the actual problem. Um, so you have a couple of different theories. One is the broken windows theory. And that's again, James Q. Wilson. And he believed that ignoring public order violations like vandalism, um, vagrancy, things like that, and disruptive behavior leads to community neglect, which, which fosters further disorder and crime. And that's a really fancy way of saying if you focus on the little stuff, then it helps the community feel less neglected. Um, and ignoring that little stuff will lead to more disorder and bigger crime. Then you have the zero tolerance strategy and it's strict enforcement of the laws, even for minor violations, with the design to send the message to more serious lawbreakers that if minor offenses are notified or noticed by the police, then the, then the bigger ones will be as well and it'll be more prompt action. Um, but when you sit there and you want to main, you want to have your main emphasis as problem-oriented policing. Now, problem-oriented policing increases effectiveness by attacking the underlying problems that give rise to incidents that consume patrol and detective time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you have a very, very poor neighborhood, 
Um, you work to try to help lift them up um, to a higher socioeconomic class as a way of dealing with the crime rather than just answering calls for service. Um, it relies on the expertise and creativity of line officers to study problems carefully and develop innovative solutions. This is where different kinds of things, you know, officers who who sit out and, you know, play basketball with kids instead of just patrolling. Um, and, it, and it also helps create a closer involvement with the public to make sure the police are addressing the actual needs of the citizens. Unless you're out there, unless you're talking with the citizens, you don't really know what their needs are. And it's a four-step process. It's scanning to gather data to define the problem. Analysis, which determines the nature of the problem, causes and possible solutions. Three is the response. You work with people, groups, and agencies to implement the solutions. And then the follow-up on the initi initiatives taken, that's the assessment. So it's scanning, analyze, response, and assessment. So I hope you guys enjoyed this or at least learned from it. Um, I will see you guys next week. Please make sure to complete your quiz. Make sure you do your review questions. If you have any issues or anything going on, feel free to contact me via email. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Thanks.